Well, um, we'll go ahead and get started. So um, thank you all for being here. Uh, this is a, one of probably the fifth uh, career chat we've done this fall and we are uh, deviated a little bit from our previous career paths. For those of you who haven't joined us in the past, we've um, had some excellent employees on as panels to do some career chats. Um, and this time um, we made a, a little turn um, and our speaker today is a longtime um, friend and I'll say family member of Need Project um, and a really great uh, uh, person and really great motivation for um, those of you who may be considering the sciences, the hard sciences, something in um, biology or in um, the medical field. Um, and it honestly is in a path that I didn't really even knew, know existed in the medical field. I thought that everybody went and got a medical degree that worked related to health and wellness. Um, so um, I am excited to introduce Alton, Alton Gayton, and he is a PhD student and viral, 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 how do you say it? Virology. Virology. I always say it wrong, obviously, um, at um, Harvard University. Uh, he is uh, in his first year uh, up in Harvard, and we've known him for a long time. Like I said, I'm really excited to hear what he's doing. Um, I heard him speak a couple of years ago, and it was uh, really inspirational and it made me feel like I was really underqualified to do anything. Um, so <laughs> without uh, further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Alton uh, to, to talk about his uh, career and where he is now and how he got here. If you've got questions or anything like that, um, feel free to type them into the chat throughout the, the talk. Um, we'll take questions um, at the end. And if you've got questions that you want to verbally ask at the end of uh, his presentation, that works as well. So Alton, it's, it's all you. All right, thank you. Yeah, I'm, so I'm super excited to be here. Um, I love talking about my research and my career path because you know I didn't necessarily know it was coming. Um, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, and that's part of the fun of sharing that because I know that there are a lot of people that are still trying to find themselves and what they want to do. So my initial interest in science actually started in high school. Uh, a lot of watching Animal Planet with my brother, or, uh, reading astronomy books, volunteering with the Need Project, and even some of my high school classes. Um, I didn't take that many science classes in high school, but the ones that I did, I actually really liked. And then came college and I thought I wanted to work with renewable energies then. I was super interested in them then. I still am now but I took some classes in biology and they started resonating with me a little bit. I was like okay you know there's something about these classes. There's something about the class itself that I really like and I want to explore a little bit more but I didn't know how to do that. So at this point um, I miss it. Sorry I meant to say that Dur throughout my talk, I'm going to bring up some scientific misconceptions uh, that I hope to demystify. So the first is that science careers are linear. And that is, that is not necessarily true. So in my mind in high school, I was under the impression that in order to be a scientist, I had to start in high school and then go to college, get a master's degree, PhD, and then become a professor. Or if I didn't want to be a professor, then I would just after college, start working in industry and the government. But that's not true. A more realistic path is one that's full of arrows and different routes that you can take. So when you get a science degree in college, you don't necessarily have to go on to a PhD. You could do a master's and start working. You can do work and go back to school. Um, and you'll see here, I actually made these um, arrows a little bit smaller because there aren't that many people that go um, from undergrad to master's to PhD. You can actually just skip, skip your master's degree and get a PhD like I'm doing. So, um, and then I've just highlighted here, like my path. So I'm currently at this PhD stage and I don't necessarily know what I want to do yet. Um, but, you know, I've got a decent amount of options, much like anyone who decides that they want to be a scientist. And that kind of go, uh, brings up a mis another misconception that your interests can't change. Um, mine definitely have. So even before I list chemical engineering here, I wanted to be a journalist. 
And before I was a journalist, I wanted to be an author. Um, and then once I got on this science train, you know, my interest changed from chemical engineering to chemistry, to cancer biology and biochemistry, to microbiology, and now where I'm at, of virology. Um, and another misconception, college classes uh, are lecture only and aren't hands-on. And that can be intimidating on its own because how are you supposed to get this hands-on uh, experience? How are you supposed to know exactly what science is like? Um, so actually in my first year biology lab, we did a lot of in-person um, hands-on activities. So what we're looking at here are some amoeba. Um, and then I think this is um, from plant extract. And then over here, our structure is called Volvox. Um, I believe uh, it's, it's been a little bit since I've looked at this, but I believe they're associated with yeast. Um, so all this to say that your classes are hands-on and you'll learn a lot too during them. And actually one of the other classes I took in my second year of being a chem major, I actually got to do a research project. Um, so here, here's my lab partner during this. And we were testing the activity of proteins and how they function. Uh, so there's a specific protein called a kinase that basically adds a, uh, it's called a phosphate group to other proteins. And you can track that activity by um, adding a dye that looks at um, whether or not phosphate groups are reacting and that dye will change colors. So actually I'll go back a slide and you'll see up here um, the different colors as our kinase labeled K here was reacting. Um, and this kinase was actually in algae. Um, so this is my first research project and it really got me to understand like how to think like a researcher, how to um, pipette even, how to design experiments and that's another misconception that undergrads can't do research in labs. Maybe it's less of a misconception and more of me just wanting to bring this to your attention. And throughout undergrad, uh, I worked in a, in a cancer biology lab at the hospital at UNC Chapel Hill. And our main focus was sugar metabolism and cancer. So I'm not sure how, how much you know about um, the energy cycle but at a certain part, there's the Krebs cycle. And that, that kind, that's at the end of sugar metabolism. And at the basis of all cancer cells, something's gone wrong and they just want to divide over and over. In order to sustain that, they just need to pull energy from anywhere. So my lab specifically was looking at how sugar was, um, how a sugar pathway was being manipulated by these cancer cells to give them more energy. And actually here, I've included a couple structures of proteins. Um, a lot of researchers that look at protein structures like to make images like this so we can see exactly how proteins are folding and how they can interact with other things. So here's a much smaller protein, and then here's a very large protein made of many um, subunits. And also, so this is kind of a, a fun fact, but Whenever we hear about E. coli in the news, usually um, E. coli is contaminating like food at a restaurant or um, food or meat at a grocery store. Um, when you're in kind of my field, E. coli is not a bad guy. Uh, labs use E. coli all the time to make uh, either DNA constructs or even express proteins so you can characterize them later. Um, and then another research project I got to do was also along the lines of um, cancer, but more focused on lipid metabolism or uh, fat metabolism. Um, so I was looking at a receptor protein, so a protein that's on the outside of breast cancer cells that helps bring in lipids to give those breast cancer cells energy. So I was looking at how the um, presence of that protein altered some cell um, processes on degrading and reusing different proteins to give the cell more energy. Um, and actually that's seen here. Um, so 
actually I should have mentioned earlier that posters and poster presentations are a big part of scientific communication. Um, they all have a general format, but um, this is like the go-to standard on how to present your research um, and really just have conversations about your, your research. Um, so I'll just kind of point out a few things that I got to do here. So um, I got to use some fluorescence microscopy here. So I um, marked specific proteins with fluorescent markers. And then under a microscope, you can, you can see these uh, proteins labeled as whatever color you want. So here I just use green and I use red for a different one. And I also use this um, pretty cool technique where you can take pictures over and over um, every couple minutes and make a movie. Um, because here, like I said, we were looking for changes in a cellular process and we were actually looking at the initiation of it. So by tagging a protein that only shows up when a certain process starts, you would expect that when there's no process going on, it's just a black screen. And then as you add um, a drug or chemical to induce a process, then you start to see more of this protein. And actually I have a video of this in a couple of slides. But I wanna point out another misconception now that science data is just all numbers and it's colorless. Well, it's not, right? And maybe this wasn't a misconception again, but it's something that I just really wanted to point out. So some data from this project. Here we're looking at, um, this, so this is DNA run on a gel. So you can kind of think of like a science gel as like a rectangular piece of jello. So if you cut holes in the top of your jello and you load DNA in, you can run an electric field through your jello and have the DNA run through the gel. So these lines here, these bands that you're seeing are different sized DNA fragments. Um, and this is just what we call a ladder. So it gives you a reference points on, on, on how big your DNA is. And then up here are our samples. And here, this looks very similar, except this is the same thing, but with protein. So you can, again, run protein through a certain kind of jello and then image it to see it later on. Um, and then this is another protein um, quantification assay. So you make your standard here and it changes color. And then based on um, the color that your samples are, you can determine the concentration of your protein. Some more images. So this is like your standard light microscopy. And these are of uh, breast cancer cells actually. And when I was talking about earlier about marking certain proteins with fluorescent tags, well, here are these cells just marked with green as seen through a green channel. And then here are those cells again marked for a different protein looking through a red channel. And then, um, so I've also included two videos. So this one is of uh, the process forming. Actually, I don't think it's playing. Okay, that's fine. Um, and then this one is not actually what I was looking at under the, the microscope, but got to see a cool video of cells dividing. Um, it's also interesting to point out that because these are cancer cells, I had mentioned that they just want to divide and divide and divide. Well, their signals that they can send to other cells nearby to also get them to replicate and divide. And you actually see that here because as one cell is getting ready to divide, the other one also changes shape and gets ready to, to divide. Like they condense a little bit and become more circular and then they break into two. So, you know, there's good data, but then there's also bad data or not so good data, data that you don't exactly want to see. So in the middle here, um, we're again looking at like running the proteins through a gel. So any pink you see here is protein. So this is what a gel should look like, like pretty clean bands, um, straight down. And then for whatever reason, uh, a gel just didn't want to work these days. So you get these weird squiggles and whatnot. And, you know, it's important to probably say that when you're doing research, you probably get as many of these failures or not so good results as you do good results. Um, and that's because you're trying to find something new. So not everything is gonna work, but when it does, 
you're just over the moon with how happy you are. And here's another uh, images of some gels. So these are um, DNA gels and they should be pretty straight. They're pretty wavy here. And then this gel DNA didn't even show up. So another misconception is that science is local or individual, or you can isolate yourself and get through your career. And that is very much not right. Um, so the, the research that I did with fat metabolism and cancer, I presented at a national conference in Indiana in 2018. Um, so uh, in this picture here are some of the people that I was in a research program with that summer, and they also were invited to present their research at this conference. Um, so here's just a, a silly picture of us. Um, this guy was also part of the, the program, and we both won uh, awards for presentation. Um, and here's the group picture here, and then um, me presenting my poster at this conference. Um, so I think it's pretty important to also address this misconception is that you have to look a certain way in order to be a scientist. Um, and I mean, like when we're younger and we're reading textbooks and learning about the history of science, you know, it's pretty easy to think that scientists have to look a certain way. And for part of, and for me at least, I was scared that I wouldn't fit in when I first started working in science. I mean, I felt that way for a little bit, but as I was able to make connections and expand my scientific network um, by applying to conferences, going to conferences, like talking to more people, I realized that science wasn't as homogenous as I thought. So the next summer, um, I was a part of another research program, this time um, here in Cambridge. And uh, I was in a, I was a part of a cohort of 14 students from all over the country. And so this picture here is um, the students as well as our mentors. And you can see like how diverse, both with respect to ethnicity, race, and gender, this group of people is. And I think that this does a really good job of representing how diverse science is in that who, no matter who you are, like you will have a place in science. A misconception number eight, scientists don't have fun. Um, I think for a lot of people, uh, scientists just sound like people that go into the lab every day and grind and do experiments. Well, that is, that is far from the truth. So again, this is from that same summer, last summer, um, same group of people. So uh, over here, we went to a island and kind of did like a... Um, team building exercise. Uh, actually, here's a ferry that took us to the island. Um, another day we went um, uh, rock climbing um, and did an obstacle course. And then for our final presentations, we thought it would be a good idea to go out to a fancy restaurant, which is like at the top of one of the buildings here in Boston and have dinner. Um, also, it's important to note that the people that you meet in summer research programs like this or at conferences are people that are going to move through their careers with you. So a lot of, about half the people in my cohort were seniors with me, and then the other half were juniors. So the people that were seniors have, all, have also applied and gotten into PhD programs or they're starting jobs. Um, and this guy right here next to me, Diego, we met last summer, he's from Oregon, and he's actually my roommate now because we both happen to end up in Boston. Um, so I thought that was pretty cool. Um, also made time for food, a lot of good food. Some of it was program sponsored, but I mean, a good portion of it was us going out and trying restaurants in the area. Um, another perk of going to a new city for research. Um, here's a bigger picture of all of us enjoying a meal together in Boston. Um, and this was kind of regular. Um, you know, it, we got to explore the city together and we also stayed in touch, you know, fought any problems that we had with lab or any struggles we were going or experiencing with our research. Um, 
yeah i mean needless to say this group of people became my family very fast and to this day we still um talk and catch up even have game nights over zoom now that that's popular misconception nine mentorship is hard to find i had two great mentors last summer who really let me explore a research question that I came up with, even though it was in a new field. So now we're talking about microbiology. It was a relatively new field to me and they let me answer a question um, and design experiments that would help answer it. Um, and they, they gave me really good guidance and mentorship, so much so that when I was presenting my final project here, um, this man right here is the, he was one of the leaders of the Human Genome Project and is the uh, president, founder of the Broad Institute, which is where I did my research. Um, so, yeah, I mean, he was front and stage for this research question or th this research presentation. And because of how thorough my training was, like, I was able to answer questions that he threw at me and we had a pretty good um, debate as seen here with our uh, hand motions. Um, so here is, here's my research from that summer. I was looking at um, bacteriophage, which, are, which is a virus that only infects bacteria. And I was looking at bacteriophage specifically related to um, a condition called inflammatory bowel disease or IBD, which is the chronic inflammation of the uh, digestion tract. Um, and previously, researchers found that there's a microbiome difference in healthy individuals or non-IBD individuals in individuals that have IBD. And for those of you that don't know what the microbiome is, this might blow your mind a little bit. So within our gut, there are like millions of bacteria just living there. They don't harm us. We don't harm them. They live there, they help us digest nutrients, pretty crazy. And the composition of that bacteria actually changes and gets, becomes less diverse when uh, you have IBD. So researchers don't yet know what causes IBD, but we do know that these changes exist. So I was trying to look at whether or not these bacteria eating viruses, bacteriophages, um, play a role in some way in these changes, whether causing these changes and causing IBD, or they just happen to appear and uh, you get changes. So um, looking at different strains of bacteria, of the same species of bacteria from different patients, I actually found that uh, there's a little cutout. So here, here in green, there are these extra genes in just the IBD patients. So I looked at this green segment to figure out what those genes were, and they actually were the genes that would code for a bacteriophage. It's like, okay, like that's, that's exactly what I wanted to do. So I took that bacteria and I added an antibiotic to it to stress the cells out to make them produce this phage. Um, it's kind of counterintuitive, but the biology checks out. Um, so by trying to make them express this phage, um, I did a DNA check seen here, um, which is what I had talked previously about running DNA through a gel to figure out if this green part, this green region popped out and if we could catch that on a gel, and we did. So the next step was trying to actually produce this phage um, which I was also able to do, which is up here, um, seen here. So this is what a phage should look like. Like it has a head, um, a tail, and some, what I like to call legs, but not all phage have these legs. And actually in the electron microscopy pictures, um, we don't have any intact phage, but you'll see like this is the phage tail, these, um, string filaments and then this round bit here is the capsid and here's a couple capsids and there so 
um, that was pretty cool for me because again, like I, this was a new field for me. I wanted to see if, you know, phage could be playing a role. And then I even got to go as far as expressing the phage and seeing them with my own eyes. And then kind of talking about the misconceptions earlier, you know, I went on and presented this research um, at a conference in Florida that October. Um, so actually, um, here are some pictures that I took. So I got to present it here. Um, the conference also went on a yacht one night and had dinner. And that was a first for me. That was pretty cool. Um, also, fun fact, Miami's buildings are not gold like this. Um, the camera just had really weird lighting, but it looks really cool anyway. And then I also got to present this research a month, uh, a month later in California. Um, and the cool thing about this conference was that I had friends both from my college as well as the summer research program that I had just done, and then some people that I met at last year's conference. So they were, the, so all these people were here, and it was a combination of, you know, seeing new faces, but also like reconnecting with people that I may not have seen in a while. So down here is actually one of my friends from college. Um, she won a presentation award, and it was super cool seeing her there because, you know, we had taken a lot of chemistry classes together and studied together in North Carolina, but then, you know, we're on the other side of the country, like, oh, hey, you know, we're still doing research. Um, up here are some people in my cohort. Um, so we went out to eat. That's not a surprise. And we also went to a beach um, and, you know, walked around, got to see the, the city. And then the cool thing about this picture here is this woman was actually the director of the summer program that I had done the previous year and she happened to be there. So it was cool catching up with her too. So again, like the network that you'll eventually build as scientists will stay with you and move with you throughout your career. Actually, my last misconception is that science is for smart people and it should be difficult to understand. And for me, this might be the biggest misconception of them all. And it's also kind of ingrained in society. So like when I have had other students in college ask what I studied and I told them chemistry, their immediate response was, oh, you're smart. And then didn't want to listen to what I had to say because they thought it would go over their head. And I don't think it's true. Like I, I, I just think that that's really relative, right? So I spent more time studying biology and chemistry more so than the average person did. So I might seem smart to them in that aspect, just because I had a different kind of information pool. Similarly, I think lawyers and historians and musicians and physicists are all super smart, which they are, but they've also spent more time mastering their crafts in different fields. Um, I think that part of being an effective scientist is having the ability to explain your research to any given audience, regardless of their background. So if you want to be super technical to match someone that's familiar with your field, great, but also know how to um, convey that information to people that you know, might not have a background in biology or chemistry. Because at the end of the day, if you're doing good research, but you don't know how to explain your science to the people that it might affect, then what good is your research? Um, so finally, just wanted to quickly add where I'm at now. Um, so I am in my first year at a PhD program and generally PhD programs are between five and six years. And I think for a lot of people, when they hear that, it's just like, whoa, like that's, that's, that's a long time. It's a long time to do five to six more years of school after you've done, you know, four years of undergrad and then the long long grade school that you all are in now. But really, grad school is more like a job. So I only have one and a half a year of classes. And then after that, the rest of my time in grad school is just doing research. So in that aspect, you know, doing research and meetings and presenting research, like that's just a research based job. Not to mention, uh, as a PhD student, you usually have your tuition paid for by the university and you also receive like a salary. So you are literally getting paid 
to get your PhD and to do research. So for some of us, it's the perfect job. Um, and uh, so I've included these pictures here. Um, when you're applying to grad school, you actually will go to the university and interview with them. It's their way of uh, getting to know you, but also your way of getting to know the program in the city. So um, I, I interviewed at a couple of different schools. Uh, this one here is New York City, and this was only the second time I'd been to New York City. So just the size of it was mind blowing, uh, an image from an airplane. Um, and, you know, I can't, I wouldn't have gotten here without the support that I've had. So just wanted to quickly, you know, thank my parents, um, my family, friends, my girlfriend, who's also going through the same thing as me now starting a PhD program. And I mean, the list goes on. So a uh, quick acknowledgement to those people and I will answer any questions. So Alton, at this time, we do have several questions that have come in in the chat. And um, if you're listening, feel free to share other questions or you're welcome to take yourself off um, and put video and ask him in person. But our fir first one is, um, what is the most rewarding part of being a scientist? Um, okay, so I have a actual answer and a silly answer. So the actual answer is just getting to know exactly how certain things work. So um, for me, I think the first moment I realized like I'm a scientist, I'm a chemist, I understand what's going on was probably my second year of college. We had, got, we had finished uh, talking about intermolecular forces and how um, different molecules stay together. And we had talked about how, you know, when you heat water, it becomes steam and the forces that are going on. So I think like the next week or the next day, uh, I was making some macaroni cheese in my dorm room and, you know, I took off the top and there's a steam and I'm like, I understand what is going on. Um, that's kind of a silly answer story, but at the root of it, I think, the most, reporting, the most rewarding part is just understanding um, what's going on in you and being able to make predictions. Um, even now with all that's going on in COVID, I've been able to kind of make predictions and educated guesses on uh, what different drugs might do, um, what kind of therapeutics might be out there. And that's all just kind of based on what I've learned um, throughout my journey. Wow, then, such a great answer. Um, and I really appreciate how you can bring it um, in such a visual way. Um, we had a, a great comment come in that they loved seeing your pictures uh, and evidence of diversity in science. And they were pleasantly surprised. So I guess their question sort of is the fact that that may be a misconception, meaning the lack of diversity. People don't realize that. Do you have any ideas of how we can get the word out and encourage um, those who are pursuing science careers that it in fact is diverse? Yeah, I think um, the biggest way is to wear your heart on your shoulder. Um, I, everyone that I come into contact knows that I'm a scientist in some way. So, you know, if I can inspire a kid that looks like me, who's younger than me, that I'm a scientist and that they can be too just by existing, I think that, you know, I've done my job there. Um, I think it's also important to um, acknowledge the diversity um, in science too. Like when there are new awards coming out or new science coming out um, to be like, okay, like here's the science, but also here's the person that did it because Many times you will be pleasantly surprised. Uh, some people are asking, Alton, if you're going to share your um, contact um, so that way they can continue to feel um, that they can you know, connect and have 
their growing um, network. Yes, yes, of course. I actually meant to put that on the last slide. So I can put that in the chat now. That would be terrific. Um, Okay, and um, someone asks, is research always original? Or kind of maybe expand upon that. How did you uh, come across to your different research ideas and things in that realm? Yeah, so that's, that's, that's a good question. Um, so at, at the root of it, research is original. Um, you know, you're always trying to expand the field, expand our knowledge. However, you can't, you can't expand it without building on something prior. So, um, I mean, a lot of the projects that I've done, a lot of the projects that um, those around me have done all come from, you know, other projects. And it's just like thinking about, oh, well, you know, this worked with this project could this also work or maybe this didn't work? Why not? Let's go answer it. So it's kind of just kind of like building with Legos, you know, you're always just building on trying to reach bigger things. Um, earlier, you mentioned that um, your study or you'll do a year and a half of classes and continued um, learning, but then the rest of the PhD is research. And you also mentioned your school is helping to pay towards your time there. So it is like a job. So um, Denisha asked, is that every school or is it just the one that you went to regarding um, having your salary um, or a stipend there for you? Um, so the vast majority of like STEM related fields are like that. Um, your tuition will be covered and you will get some form of a salary or stipend. Yep. Um, another question comes um, in regards to the fact that you displayed your data on those, the poster boards, uh, I mean, larger than poster boards. Um, was that a skill that you learned prior to college? Or is that something that you learned along the way while you were doing your first research project or did your mentor teach you? Yeah, so it was a combination of just learning along the way and also having mentor input. Um, honestly, it was kind of scary the first time that I did it. Um, but the first time that I was able to do it, I was with my lab partner. So we kind of split the what we needed to add. And we went through many, many rounds of editing. So, you know, putting it all up there and then printing it out and combing over it with a fine comb to figure out, you know, like, are there any typos? What else do we need to add? And then everyone has their own kind of um, twist that they like to put on them. And that just takes time to figure out like what you like, uh, what your style is. But yeah, it's just, it's, it's developed. Mm, I don't really think, um, like professors are pretty, uh, pretty helpful there and understanding that you won't have that kind of background coming in or experience coming in to undergrad. What a great point. Um, professors are certainly very understanding and understand that that's uh, part of the process of learning. So this question um, is, I would say, more of an open-ended in the sense of it <laughs> is not directly from your particular past. So I'll just kind of go in that direction a little bit. Um, so in this current field of very highly politicized, lots of political um, experiences all around us, do you have any thoughts as to how science does not get caught up in the political world and that we can maintain the sanctity and purity of the scientific process? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, I think it starts by, you know, learning exactly, you know, what the scientific process is, right? And all that goes into it, because it's, it's not easy to um, present a new piece of information 
that might be new to the field or could contradict something that's already out there. You know, it's, it's not easy, but, you know, in taking the steps, you're showing that you're taking the time to really prove something um, and that it is worth listening to. And I think, yeah, it's, it's been difficult to listen to science be politicized in recent times. Um, but I find comfort in that um, other scientists also kind of, you know, stand strong, stand t together and accept what is right or wrong based off of data and not feelings. Certainly. Uh, I appreciate your response with that one. Um, we have uh, someone curious as to how did you decide which college colleges you were going to attend um, from Kendall? Um, yeah, so that was not an easy decision. Um, I think I cast a pretty wide net. Um, I was looking at both like what the school had to offer as far as majors went and then also like size and location. Um, financial aid played a big part in widowing out some of those, uh, some of those choices. Um, but then I think honestly, at the end of the day, it came down to a gut decision um, based off of the schools that I had on my list and the ones that I had gone to, to really hear what they had to say and it, take it in for myself. Um, I know it's not a great answer, but everyone I think has a different way of making that decision. What a great point because uh, in this situation where there's so many to choose from, it's very important to know that we can um, hear different people's perspective. Do you have any advice on the opportunities of internships or how to go about looking for internships? Yeah, so um, internships and like research programs, like I mentioned, are, are, are pretty big. Um, I think the best way to go about looking for them is one maybe uh, contacting people you know that have gone through them to see if they could you know share their experience with like a specific one but um for me google was my best friend with this um i just typed in you know either cancer summer research program or uh, immunology summer research program and uh, made a spreadsheet and just kind of like compared different things. Um, actually, uh, so I didn't do any formal internships um, in college regarding this, but at least with some research programs, like you also, they'll also pay usually for your housing, your travel and give you like a stipend um, for like food and stuff for over the summer. You mentioned your cohort and um, a variety of different people you have met um, along the way. Have you, uh, would you say that being a part of a cohort is um, beneficial? Um, besides some of the items you've already listed, is there any other positives to having a cohort? Yeah, yeah. So there, there are a lot. Um, so within my friend group in college, like I was probably the only one that was really um, science minded or wanting to go on to get a PhD. So when I was just looking for support on, you know, applications or interviews or, you know, like what schools I was looking at, is this a good list, is it a bad list? You know, I didn't have my friends in college there to really know what I was going through. So at least with the application process, yeah, like having my research cohorts was great because they're all going through the same thing that I was going through. And I mean, now the the juniors are, well, now seniors are, are going through that. Um, but it's also just nice to um, catch up with them, see how they're doing, like talk about my research, their research, you know, you learn a lot just talking about um, 
your research like nothing super professional just casually even is i mean my roommate and i do that all the time he comes back from from work and we just talk research easily for 30 minutes to an hour sometimes so it certainly sounds like it helps to have a support team um like you said just even to be able to even if it's not about your direct uh, results or their direct results being able to kind of hear what someone else is going through um do you have any additional um thoughts or items that you that have popped into your head that you wanted to share with um at this point i don't have additional questions coming in but oh it looks like we have one it says um is there anything that you could have done differently in college that you you think uh as you look back on your college time yeah um Yeah, so hmm, I guess the only thing that I could probably think about what I would have done different was um, trying more classes, like a larger variety of classes. Um, like my major is pretty intensive, so I didn't have a lot of flexibility in my schedule to try different things. So I think knowing that maybe I would have, you know, maybe done a little lighter of a major and tried a bunch of different things to see uh, what I wanted to do earlier. But um, yeah, nothing, nothing too big. Are there any tips um, regarding those who are still currently in, in high school? Um, some listening in might be in the beginning years of their college career as well, but um, tips for, for them. I mean, as you mentioned, Google could be a really great tool to find um, internships related to very specific ideas, but um, any other ideas as to how they can begin deciding if they haven't already, figuring out which direction they might want to go or? Yeah, um, so, okay. So if not, if not Google, I really like YouTube too. Um, I watch a lot of, you know, random science videos on everything. Like there are good, a, a, a couple good channels that just kind of cover anything science related that I really like. Um, you know, not necessarily for me to uh, start moving towards, but just so I could stay up to date in that. But so there's that. And I think um, asking uh, family, friends, or friends, um, anyone that you know that might be in college or might have like a connection to someone that's in college, just to ask them about, you know, where they're at, what they're thinking, that could also be helpful. And I think a third would be um, just to reach out to professors. Um, I think, so if you're, if you're in high school and you reach out to a college professor and just being like, hey, like, you know, I just want to learn, you know, about what you do or, you know, ask them about their career paths or um, ask them if they have different resources available to you, they would be honestly probably blown away by the fact that you're thinking so far ahead. But, you know, that it's, that's, that's a good thing, so. Great, um, speaking of YouTube, you mentioned that you watch a lot of videos on YouTube. I had a um, earlier, Mary School mentioned that she's a big fangirl of yours. Well, looks like there's some other fans. They said, have you considered videotaping a session like this and putting it out there for other people, which we are videotaping, of course, recording. But you have been such an inspiration um, so far in both with your, your comments about what misconceptions, or as you mentioned, sometimes it's just not necessarily a misconception, but rather um, a comment of, what people may not realize. So I just wanted you to hear that positive feedback. Other people would certainly benefit from, as you said, wearing what you love on your sleeve and, and um, encouraging these ladies from the STEM Academy and others who might be listening. Um, so I guess in one word, what, how you uh, wanna close it out, whether it's a, you know, a inspiration or if it's like something that you love, we can um
Ooh. Sorry, is the one word uh, maybe a phrase? A phrase. Yeah, I was thinking of a phrase. Um, probably you can do it. You know, like as long as you put your your mind to it, your passion about it, you can do it. Well, we certainly appreciate your time um, tonight, Alton, and I think it is uh, certainly a, a story that many of us um, can look up to and see as a great example. I can share with my students at school your, your story, for instance. Um, and I do want to mention to those who are, um, who are on the call as well that um, we really would love for you to continue to check out the exelonstemacademy.org. You are able to sign up for additional events that we have coming up. There's a professional skills session uh, coming up, as well as a terrific session with um, UC University of Chicago, Coded Bias and a discussion with the director. So for all of those um, opportunities and more, you can take a look. We even have a mentorship uh, program and continue to look for um, emails uh, about the Exelon STEM Academy and additional resources that you, may, you might be able to um, gather. So feel free to take a look there. Um, and I see that some people are um, saying thank you. And don't forget, um, ladies and gentlemen, um, he did share his email address and so, um, it's always a great opportunity to begin uh, your network as well. So thank you so much for joining tonight. I know it's, um, it's a lot out of a, um, on a Wednesday night, but certainly uh, continue to stay in touch with excellonstomachonomy.org and um, thank you Alton for taking time with us. My pleasure, thanks for having me.